You're listening to the Christian Indie Artists and Songwriters Podcast, the place where faith, music, and life intersect. We exist to help Christian indie artists and songwriters just like you get songs heard. Hey, I'm here with my friend Ross King coming to us live from Tennessee. How's it going this morning, Ross? I'm doing great, buddy. Thanks. Awesome. Well, we'll I'm excited to have you on. Like we were just saying, you know, I've just seen a, a pattern of, of your name popping up when people mention champions and encouragement. So I'm excited to hear part of your story and uh, share it with the audience. So with that in mind, like where did you kind of get started with music? Where did it all kind of begin for you? Yeah. So I grew up in Texas in a small town, Bryan, College Station area. It's where Texas A&M is. And mm. I, my family was musical in a very basic way. Like my mom plays piano. Um, pretty well for like church type stuff, but wasn't, you know, it wasn't like her job. And my dad loved music, always playing music in the house, liked to sing. But for some reason, I just, as a kid, just started getting really interested in uh, writing, like the actual like writing, writing. And so I was always writing short stories and poetry and stuff like that. And I think at some point in high school, I just started um, getting really interested in stuff like drums or like piano. And so mm. I just, you know, kind of on, on my, and, and my mom would put me in piano lessons and things. And, uh, I never did very well at that, you know, I mean, I, I, kind of that classic example, I would memorize the song, uh, and then my piano teacher would like quiz me, like, where are you on the page? And I would, mm. and I wouldn't be able to tell her cause I had just like memorized it, you know, like, cause yeah. I, I really couldn't read it very well. And so I, um, so yeah, I just started doing that. And, and maybe around high school, I started writing songs with, with, with a band and th- it was funny because they were like super cool. Like they wrote like alternative music, you know, cool, mm. like uh club music or something, right. Stuff that, that, yeah. that had street cred. And I was writing like Richard Marks, Chicago music, <laughs> you know, just hey. like pop, I, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. looking back, it was probably the good choice for me, but yeah. it just, it kind of felt like, Oh, here comes the cheesy. And I would be at the drums, like playing my, I was the drummer. So I would like, you know, do okay. the drummer thing, singing a song. So it was pretty, pretty corny. Cause I'm, I'm like, okay, the drummer's going to sing now. It's going to be the most, you know, slow dance ballad, you know, sappy, <laughs> you know, artsy thing. So that's kind of how it started. And then, and then just as I got into college, I, you know, I'm sure you've seen this, but when you're young and good at something like this, it's like, there's sort of a weird funnel where, Oh, suddenly I'm the be- best person I know at this, you know, mm-hmm. like in my little area, in my little pond. And so you continue from that. I just kept kept doing that until the end of college and thought, all right, I have I have a college degree, but it's not what I really want to be doing. It's not what I am doing. You know, I'm I'm getting calls to do to lead worship or to 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 play a coffee house or to play for a youth group or something. And so it just slowly merged into what I was what I was doing. Yeah, so it sounds like it was a natural progression. So, you know, taking all that experience and playing in bands and stuff and writing songs, like, was there a distinct moment where you're like, Hey, I think I can be like a, this is what I'm going to do as far as the songwriting side and the performance side to where it's like, this is my, I'm all in, this is my game plan. Or was it something that just sort of happened over time? It did happen over time, but I do remember one really distinct thing. I'm 49 years old, so I was in college in the 90s. And so I was at Texas A&M, there was a, there was a Christian fraternity called Bucks. It's like Brothers Under Christ, and I, it's probably mm. still a thing. But they would have these big sort of festival, like like mini festivals on the college campuses with music and stuff. And, you know, they would usually – the version I, I, I saw was like – Let's get a local person to open, then let's get a kind of a regional person after that, and then let's get like a big CCM artist if we can afford it after that, right? So they kind of build it like that. Yeah. And I would always get the local guy thing, you know, like for the Bucks thing, but for for anything lo- anything local, I would get the local opening act thing. And I was still in college, but but I remember there was this one year. Do, do you remember a, gam- a band called Cademan's Call? Heck yeah, I do. They're awesome. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, so th- so they were coming up. They were from Houston. And so I had all these mutual friends with them. And so they were coming up at the time and they were like doing this almost like early Dave Matthews band thing where they were everywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but they weren't signed. You know what I mean? Like it was like, they're, you know, like these kind of grateful dead sort of situations where their fans just follow them everywhere. And it was like a live band. Yeah, exactly. They were almost like a jam band, you know, and Mm -hmm. they were super good. There's like seven or eight, eight of them on stage. Right. And they were terrific. Well, I got put first. It was like going to be me, then Cademan's, and then somebody signed, right? And so, but it was my home crowd. Mm. So I played this show of like, for like a thousand people. And 
I killed, but it was mostly because it was my home crowd, right? It wasn't yeah. like I was so great. Like I, I was okay, <laughs> right? But but Cademan's was like, whoa, that guy crushed. You know what I mean? Like the crowd is yeah, going yeah. crazy for him. <laughs> and so they came to me and were like, hey, let's do some stuff together. So they had me opening up for a couple like, and, you know, and, 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 and they're blowing up, right? So they're like, hey, we're going to do a new CD release concert and it'll be our biggest thing we've ever done. And it's sold out three nights or whatever. And you should open up for us, you know? So it was like this perfect thing. And that was my senior year. And then at the same time at Texas A&M, there's a thing called Breakaway, which is still going on. It meets in the basketball gym with like 10,000 college students every Tuesday night. Well, at the mm. time, it was running like 1,000 people. And Chris Tomlin was the leader of it. But he was kind of getting, you know, attention. So mm -hmm. they needed someone to replace him. And I had led worship for like 80 people a bunch of times, right? But I wasn't like, <laughs> I wasn't a big deal in that way. Well, they approached me and they said, hey, could you lead for this 800 to 1,000 college students thing on Tuesday nights? And I was super nervous because I hadn't done anything of that scale. And I said, ah, I think so. And, and I actually went and found this other guy who had worked with Chris it had kind of been Chris's like side guy. And I say, hey, could you kind of hold my hand in this deal? You and I could kind of co-lead it. And mm -hmm. so he and I, his name is Michael Armstrong. He and I ended up leading Breakaway for five years. I led for five. I don't know. I think he was maybe three or four. So that started when I graduated, right? So essentially, even though it wasn't a big paid job, you know, get a Cabin's Call gig where I like suddenly like sell a bazillion CDs really fast because yeah. they're, you know, they have this crowd and that crowd seeing me. And at the exact same time, I get this Breakaway gig where I lead for a thousand people every Tuesday night. And neither of those things was like necessarily going to make me rich, right? Because yeah. it was just like selling CDs out of the back of my car and and getting paid like a hundred bucks a week to do this Tuesday night thing. But both were so much exposure mm -hmm. that I just suddenly was like, oh, I'm not getting a job. This is my job. I just moved back home, lived in my parents' basement, just, you know, at the, I mean, I'm a single guy, so... Sure. And I'm getting paid a lot of cash and I'm, you know, it's just, it, it was kind of easy to call that a job. And so I ended up just, you know, just answering the phone and very, very disorganized, you know, pile of like paper scraps and, and napkins with my gigs on them and stuff. You know, it was a mess. Probably broke a lot of tax laws and stuff, right? Just like, <laughs> just really just flying by the seat of my pants. But, you know, suddenly between those two sort of strange acceptance moments, you know, from someone bigger than me, someone more influential than me, and, and I had a job. Right. And, and if I thought it through, Brian, I don't know that I, I would have done the same thing. Right. I mean, it was it was just kind of like, hey, right now people are paying me money right now. People are wanting me to do something cool. I should say yes right now. There was zero five year plan. You know, I think that there's so much to that, though, because how do you start a business or how do you operate a business is I think the key is to identify the need. And whether you did that or not, God kind of created that need and you were able to fill it simultaneously because maybe if it was just one thing, it wouldn't have been enough. You know, right. but since it was both at once, it was like, okay, this is what I do. Right. Now. And looking back, and I think you'll find, you'll find this interesting because of the whole indie thing. The nineties were a totally different time for Christian music. I wanted to be Rich Mullins, Keith Green, uh, Randy Stonehill. I wanted to be Steve Camp. I, I wanted to be this like prophet poking at the hornet's nest, saying difficult <laughs> things. And people were doing that. Like on mainstream Christian music radio, you were hearing songs that were, that were, provocative and intellectual. And, and I'm not saying that's better than what's happening now, but it was, but you were hearing an Andrew Peterson style thing was, was happening everywhere. Right. And so I thought, yeah. Oh, I'll just do that. But I wasn't a great performer. Like I was just okay at it. Like I always joked that coming up around Tomlin, cause Chris, Chris and I were in college at the same time. He was, you know, getting the, you know, the, the Baptist student group gig. And when he couldn't do it, he was calling me and giving me the scraps, you know? So I was watching what he was doing and I was always joking that Chris had this like, hello, Cleveland kind of quality, you know, hello, Cleveland, get on your feet, you know, and the place goes crazy. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I just didn't have that at all. Like I wanted mm -hmm. to sit on a stool with a beverage in my hand and just talk about the songs and play them. Right. And even yeah. my worship style was just so much less performance and kind of in, super big engaging. I, I didn't have that. I thought in my mind, I'm going to be one of these sort of sagey songwriters, you know, even at 25, that's, the, that's, that's what I wanted. And looking back, that's really an indie track, right? Like mm. you don't really do that. And looking at, at, at where CCM went in the last 20 years, you don't, you just don't see a bunch of those voices of like, oh, this person stayed in the business for 20 years writing thought provoking, 
you know, poke the bear profity songs. You know, there's just not much of that. And that's not me making a complaint. It's just, that's an observation. But I couldn't have known that. And that's kind of back to that thing we were saying, like, you know, what I could have known and, and what I would have done differently. I'm glad I didn't know, but, but I certainly would have probably uh, uh, mapped out the journey a little bit differently if I'd known, oh, no, no, there's not going to be a place for, for that guy, like in the mm. mainstream, you know, or if there is, it's not me. Because even, even Andrew Peterson, who's terrific at it, isn't really mainstream, right? It's not like he's, you know, he's not, he's not casting crowns, right? All that to say, there was a lot of like what I thought a, a CCM career could be and what I thought a mainstream CCM career, career could be. And, and, I, and I really thought I, f- I fit that, but I just didn't. And it took mm. a little while. Yeah, you know, that's another part of the story. But it took a little while for me to kind of realize, oh, they, they're not interested in what I'm doing at that <laughs> level. They just want me to write songs. So you mentioned you're selling CDs and stuff. So are, you're, are you mainly leading or performing original songs at the Texas A&M thing, the breakout nights? Or is that like kind of blending popular worship songs at the time? Or like, what did that look like? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it, it was, you know, and again, you go, go back to the, to the 90s and it's just a different time for worship because there wasn't the kind of crazy ubiquitous like you know deluge of songs right it, it wasn't yeah. didn't have the, quite as much of that you, you we were going to vineyard and integrity and maranatha type stuff right but mm-hmm. um but yes we i was writing worship for that because we because we decided to make records and so i started producing records for them and so but i didn't want it to be i always had this thing this ethic where i didn't want to play a song of mine and it be like super obvious that mm. it was my song. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think it's yeah. really uncomfortable when you sit in a worship set and a, and, and a worship leader plays five or six songs. And four of those are these like killer Hill songs, you know, whatever songs. Yeah. They just feel like songs. And you hear something in the middle that's like, this feels forced. It doesn't feel great. It doesn't feel, you know, I had a desire to be seamless. And that's probably because deep down I was more of a songwriter and more of kind of a pastor than I ever was a true, like, modern worship leader. You know, I'm not a really Mm -hmm. great modern worship leader, and I'm not going to put too many explanations on that phrase, but I just, I'm just not that good at it. But I loved writing songs excellently, and I loved pastoring in in a way that felt seamless and right, okay? So when those two Mm -hmm. came together, it was, okay, I'm not going to introduce songs that don't feel really right, and, and so in my mind, there, there was kind of two standards for that. One was, the highest one was obviously, does it feel like it's just right for these people and, a, and, a, and an excellent musical song? And the second was probably less important, but I would, I would kind of say, I'm not just going to try to write another song about these same things better than that guy does. He's, he's mm-hmm. awesome at it. You know, Bethel's yeah. awesome at it or whatever. I'm not going to beat that. So I would often like write in the spaces, you know, and, 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 I, and I would say, what do youth groups in America need to be saying that they're not? You know, what mm. am I hearing when I'm at these events that preachers keep saying? And they're like, now the band's going to come up and play, you know, and, and yeah. what am I hearing that needs to be sung in those moments? But when those moments are, are happening, I don't have a song for it. Does that make mm. sense? Like, yeah. So I would say, OK, well, and so I would just start taking notes about like, hmm, I keep hearing this kind of thing pop up. And every time I don't really have a song in my arsenal for this. So I'm going to write one. I figured it, it, it ought to be excellent and seamlessly good with the rest of the songs. But if it's not, it ought to be only in the set because its content is necessary. So I'm going to make sure I play this thing mainly because no one has said repentance, blah, blah, blah. You know, this hasn't mm-hmm. been a thing I've heard. And a bunch of these speakers and pastors are asking for repentance or calling us to repentance. And I don't have a song for it. No one has a song for it. There might be one out there, but I'm not aware of it. So that was, those were kind of my guardrails was as good as what's being played and or in the spaces between what's being played. I love that. I had a friend who studied architecture in college, and I remember him explaining to me the the idea of negative space. Mm, and it was like, yes. it's not the thing, it's the leftover area. And that's exactly your right. target, which is so important, especially in a kingdom sense, because, you know, we all, we all have our roles to fulfill. And if we're all kind of trying to be the hands, then you know, what's what there's so much more than that. So for you to actually target those areas, I love that. Like the negative space is such a such a cool concept. And obviously it served you well because you've been able to get songs out there that are maybe not just that same thing hammering it over and over again. So with that, like in the journey, where did you start to kind of equip 
other people, because I know that you're obviously a songwriter for, you know, your own stuff, but then other people are obviously singing and cutting your songs too. So, you know, where did that journey, did that kind of start in that season as well as connecting with other writers and then starting to actually work? Yeah. I mean, I would say it started because of the breakaway thing in the sense it started with worship. So there were a bunch of things happening at the time that were probably precursors of, of what you'd see now. And it's the idea of the parachurch was huge mm. in the late nineties, early two thousands. So there was all these like, you know, this thing breaks. Breakaway. Well, Breakaway birthed. Breakaway with some other college stuff birthed passion, you know, college mm. movement. So that's a parachurch, right? So it's mm-hmm. it's a it's coming alongside the church. It's not a Sunday morning thing. So passion was happening. And all these college campuses had some version of that, like a lot of like Baylor and and I mean, anywhere you went in the country, a lot of big colleges, a lot of state schools, like, you know, big schools would have these Bible studies trying to like reach it, you know, the whole, the whole campus or whatever. So that was happening. There were lots of camps, like there's a camp called student life that got really big during that time. Well, all those people made records. Mm. Like that was kind of thing that that they did, you know, and this is all pre like Hillsong and elevation and, and, and kind of what you and I would maybe describe like, as like church movements that are, you know, not a denomination, but they're okay. So this was almost like the parachurch version of that was going on. And so if you were in a youth group in the United States of America, you would probably getting student life camp brochures, I invite you to come and just, hey, instead of putting on a camp, come to our really awesome camp and we'll have this huge worship leader there that's really famous, blah, blah, blah. And they would do records. Like like they'd have people like, they'd, they'd bring in guests, you know, people and they would do records and stuff. And, and all these huge college ministries were doing records. So all that to say, Breakaway, where I was, was was getting a bunch of requests, licenses, you know, like, hey, we like the, you know, because we were selling like 40,000 records, right? I mean, it was crazy. Wow. Like, yeah. and again, this pre this is pre the internet, right? So yeah. I, I don't even know how it was even happening, really. <laughs> but yeah. but we sold all these records. Well, part of it was that college kids were leaving, going home, taking taking our records, Right. And then they're showing them to their youth groups and their college groups and their churches. So I was getting a bunch of licenses like, Brian, this will fascinate you because of what what you do with independent artists. The current rate for a song at the time was 8.3 cents per unit sold. All right. So Mm -hmm. that was the total value of a sold song. It's it's currently currently at about 10 cents. Number doesn't really matter anymore because no one buys music. But what it meant was if someone bought a CD and it had 10 songs on it or whatever, and I had a song on it, that song was worth 8.3 cents every time someone bought a CD, right? Mm-hmm. So I was getting, I'm not joking, I have a file cabinet somewhere in, in, in our house that has hundreds of $83 licenses. Mm-hmm. We made 1,000 units, here's $83. So wow. I would get like $83 checks like 20 times a year. I mean, and occasionally I was getting 160 six dollar checks i mean just it was such a strange world okay because i wrote the songs by myself right it wasn't there wasn't any co-writing at at, at the time they paid a lot lot license so that was sending my songs everywhere so suddenly ccli was coming in right Mm -hmm. and i'm one of these guys who will be super transparent about the about the money side because i got nothing to lose because i'm not like super super rich about in 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 this world or whatever but but i was making like ten thousand dollars a year on ccli just mm. because of the breakaway influence pushing the songs out. And so even at the, at the time, so here I'm like 29, 30, and I have way more influence as a writer than I do as a person. And nobody even knows it's me, right? It's not even like the songs are huge because the songs aren't on the radio. Yeah. It's this weird like underground viral, you know, kind of mini yeah, yeah. viral thing. Because again, $83 means that they made a thousand of them and they probably right. never sold the whole thousand. Right. Mm. Occasionally someone sold 2000 or whatever, but usually they sold 600 and the rest were sitting in their garage or whatever. Right. So so I had tons and tons and tons of that weird level of small influence. And there's a whole like if I ever write a memoir, probably something really significant about that, that I had so many eighty three dollar licenses. Right. That 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 said something about what was happening and, and, and how unique that it was, because it wasn't like I was huge or famous or known. I just had this weird little consistent thread of like small bits of influence. But that pocket is such a, like you said, such a unique, this viral, organic, underground distribution channel, really, you know, and it's all through this one source, you know, Texas, but then like you said, going out and then because of that, just the ripple effect, especially, you know, you're basically kind of just going into this, like you just decided, hey, this is my job, you know, basically like from what God did. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, there's 
it's being financed in this unique way, you know? So, so did people start like, once they started seeing maybe your name, were they, were people like seeking you out specifically, or was it just about the, the breakout like group in general? No, I think o- over time, I mean, we, we were really careful at the time, um, probably too careful to not make it the Ross King band or the Michael Armstrong band. We, we were always the breakaway band. And, and I think that part of looking back, you know, like, you know, you, you look back over your life and think, oh, I could have done that better. I could have been smarter there. I, I, I was probably working too hard to be like anonymous guy. I've always been really, really scared of and kind of suspicious of self, self-promotion. And, and I, and I want to be clear that I wasn't always being fair. You know, I, I, mm. I was probably too scared of it and too suspicious of it. But uh, it was mostly the breakaway thing. But even still, I'm writing so many songs. They're getting so much play in random places that over time, it was like, all right, I could tell I was becoming known as a, as a songwriter. And I would start getting calls. Can you write with me? But we'd love to kind of create our own version of, of these ideas, you know. And at some point mm. in, in there, I'm, you know, and again, I'm also at the, at the same time, and I haven't mentioned this, I'm at the same time, I'm really, really in, interested more than worship. I'm interested in, interested in writing independent singer songwriter provocative profity storyteller stuff right and i'm mm, doing a whole yeah. other thing that that in my mind is rich mullins bob dylan that kind of world and i'm kind of in, interested in pop that entire time because that was another weird little mm. thread is that i didn't really love contemplative singer songwriter music all the time i kind of just liked i was i was sort of obsessed with the idea that someone could write a pop hook that didn't matter you know what i mean mm. but it was compelling yeah. Like, I mean, I know you, I know you get this because you do a lot of songwriting too. It's like, there's a way that you can be super engaged by like a meaningless lyric when the melody is so hooky, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think a lot about this um, Levitate song by Dua Lipa. Do you, have you, have you heard this song? It's like the pop funk thing, Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. It's like, da 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 And it's so hooky. And there's a moment mm-hmm. in like the little sort of turnaround. It's, it's like a, you know, you know, pop songs now that's like, what's the chorus and what's the bridge? Because they keep singing them both, right? But yeah. there's this place where she just goes, yeah, 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 yeah. And I just, every time it comes on, I, I like pause it. My kids are so mad. I'm like, guys, listen, that is magic. <laughs> she just sang, yeah, five times and I, I can't hear it enough, right? That there's some uh, weird little thing there, right? So I was always interested in the kind of the mechanics of that. Like, why was that, why did that work? And I wasn't very good at that side of it. I was just a lyric guy. Mm. So so yeah. this whole time, I'm also trying to write Ross King songs. I know it sounds pretentious, but I'm trying to write songs no. for me to do artist stuff. And I'm trying to find pop hooks and I'm trying to write provocative lyrics. I'm trying to tell great stories. I, I'm, I'm trying to get people to think in the spaces, right? Because deep down, I didn't, I didn't really think I had the worship writing thing. And, and I still don't really think I have it. Like I, I'm okay at it. Mm. But I knew I could write songs that would push people's brains and hearts in ways that were different if I didn't have the parameters and guardrails of let's make this a congregational song, right? I, I knew that if I was just writing to write and just to write a three and a half minute song that I could do things. And so somewhere in there, I wrote that song, Clear the Stage, which you may have heard, you know, but but that yep. that kind of, and that was like 1999 or 2000, right? That's a long, long time ago, mm. but it just, something happened. I mean, it had like a zeitgeist thing. It just, mm. it hit something. And that was probably that's that that's the career song, right? And it's but it's also one of those things where that catapulted me in a different way. Suddenly, the CCLI uh, worship songs weren't the songs that were getting me all the attention. That song was. It was showing up on mixtapes, and so hmm. people wouldn't know it was me. And then Jimmy Needham a few years later did it, and then it took a whole other life. He was twenty times more popular than than me, and so was heard twenty times as much, you know, or whatever. I remember I bought the. I think I bought maybe the CD of that. Um, Jimmy, possibly. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, the song. The, the record was called "Clear Through the Stage." Yeah, yeah. I remember the. I mean, and I remember the first time I saw her name, and I was like, you know, now getting the the story of like that negative space idea where you're kind of writing in those areas that people. So it's like the mecha- you you strive for the mechanics of the pop hook because you know, like I've I've learned like the melody is what brings people in and the lyrics are what keep them there. Oh yeah. You know? Yeah. So no, like, like that song you, when you, when you and I co-wrote the, that, that, that one time with, you know, we kind of got yeah, pulled Miracle in with Man. Jonathan and you know, yep. there was so much hookiness to it, but I didn't feel like it executed the idea well enough. You know, but yeah. you guys had hooks all all day long, like melodic hooks. It was it was really yeah. hooky. Yeah. So like, and then bringing that in. So I think that's what is so cool about Clear the Stage is like I was like, um, 
I've never heard anyone say jerk the pew in a song before, yeah. but I totally get it. And like, it's like, I needed that. So you being able to communicate those ideas within the context of like hooks and well-written stuff is great. So is that the thing that, cause obviously you said Texas, you know, was where you, you came from and started, but obviously Nashville, you know, Tennessee now is clear the stage, the kind of the thing that pulled you into that world or what, what did that journey look like gapping from Texas to Nashville? Well, there was a, there were a couple of brief periods where Clear the Stage or a couple of other random songs that I had written as an artist got me attention out here. One of the one of the funny quick stories that I'll tell you is Clear the Stage ended up playing on like a syndicated show that was based in Dallas. So it was people that knew me or, you know, or, you know, mm. they, they weren't super, they, they weren't like random fans. They, they knew people that knew yeah. me or whatever. Right. So it was, it was just, it was a normal connection kind of thing. And they played the song on this show that was syndicated. Well, because it was syndicated, it plays on all these other stations all over the country. People, you know, a lot of times in Christian radio, particularly, they don't know where something's coming from. So people started calling in to these few stations in other places and saying, we heard this song on your radio station. And of course, and this is just some DJ going, oh, that was Thursday night. Okay, the, okay that, that was during the show. Oh, that's syndicated. <laughs> you know, and so at, at whatever level they were dedicated to like helping their fans find the song, a few of these stations found the song on, on the show and started playing it. Well, Brian, mm. I had like a, a weird moment of like being on the charts, like in like wow. some regional areas with Clear the Stage. And it's like this, and, and my version is like five and a half minutes long, like my old version. I mean, it's it's just a <laughs> yeah. beast of a kitchen sink thing. So I, I, but I had no idea this was this was go- going on. And suddenly I just started getting calls because I had like a distributor who was distributing my, my music to different places. And he's like, hey, something's happening like in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and you're just selling a ton of music. And so, you know, again, this is birth, this is early internet. So I just start chasing it down and realize, oh, I'm like number five on that pretty large section of Pennsylvania or whatever, I'm, I'm, I'm charting. Well then, you know, like John Mays from, from wherever he was at the time, you know, who's, he's at Centricity now, but he was a big Mm A&R guy and he's chasing down my, whoever could confine me and and I'm going to Nashville and meeting with John Mays, you know, but, but what happened, Brian, was when those situations would happen, because they happen a handful of times in the, in those early years, they would kind of, they would vet me. And realize, oh, he he just wants to sit on a stool and play his songs. He's not going to do what mm. we kind of want to do, you know. And that's mm. not an insult to what CCM does, but but I mean, at some sure. level, it is kind of an insult. I mean, I mean, you know, it's frustrating, you know. It's like they they don't want that, right? So all that to say, I, I had these kind of brief glimpses into the Nashville thing, but I would always realize, oh no, when when I like just let myself loose to be me, there's no CCM mainstream place for me. Like, you know, mm. when I'm really just me, right, a, as a writer. So what would it be like for me to try to write more directly, more like targeted, more more deliberately, you know, maybe even more kind of mechanically, mm. right? And I've just always been, been a person who loves the idea of like, oh, I made that, you know, and whether it's a woodworking job or cooking or, or songwriting, the idea that I go into a space with a bunch of raw materials and make something and it's, and it's enjoyed is like, you know, that's a drug for me. I mean, I love, I, I love it probably too much. If you and I ever like co-wrote just the two of us, I always have to warn you like, Hey man, in like an hour when we're writing and I seem super excited about my idea and you don't care for the idea and, you, and you're afraid to tell me, here's the thing. I'm just excited to be doing this. Don't translate my excitement in the moment of, Hey man, this lyric's perfect. You you have to love it. It's hey man, we're making lyrics. Isn't this the best? You know what I mean? Like yeah, I'm just yeah, like yeah. a kid about it, you know. And, and and so all that to say, I I started like chasing songwriting like that and saying I'm gonna make stuff. I'm gonna see why it is that a song like Dua Lipa's Levitate, which obviously this is before that. But when I heard when I hear a song that just works because it's just so hooky, I want to figure out why that is, and I want to try to write a hook. And so I was doing things like writing camp theme songs where it was just mm. about shouting and getting nine-year-olds to jump up and down, just a hook, you know? And, and they'd give me yeah. a theme like, get real or be a champion or whatever. And I'd be like, hey, I'm going to write that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a great time with that. You know, mm. and so I was just trying to learn how to do that, you know, like just make, make, make. And so at some point I got, I was at a, I was at a conference for independent songwriters and producers. And I met a woman named Cindy Wilt, who at the time was just finished, had been, had been pretty high up in publishing at Word. And I had met her hmm. years years before when I'd written some songs that somebody was in, interested in, but but we ended up at a random like sort of like roundtable lunch, and she's like, "I think I know who you are," and I was like, "I think I know who you are," 
you know, and the rest of the table's like, oh, great, this guy's ru- ruining it. He he actually knows someone, you know, and because they were all <laughs> we're all independent people there, you know. So she pulled yeah. me aside after the meeting and is like, hey, I'm now doing some consulting with songwriters to develop them. Would you want to come? Would you want to show me some of your stuff and then maybe come out to, to Nashville to do some CCM so- songwriting? And, I, and at the time, I was totally done with CCM. I had been rejected. Mm. Long story short, I, Clear the Stage had been picked up by Casting Crowns and then last minute rejected. And mm. it was this huge blow of like, oh, I'm going to be featured on, on a record by the biggest band in Christian music. Oh, what? Oh, oh no, wait, they wrote something else that they like better. And so I mm. was like, no, never again. I'm never toying ever again with CCM. It just you know, fiddles with my feelings or whatever, you know? And <laughs> so I was like, no, Cindy, I'm not interested. But I, but I said, here, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some music. And she listened to the music for like a month and called me and was like, hey, I've got like an hour of critiques and thoughts. And no one had ever done that, you know, had ever like really listened. Mm. That was like an industry person. And she was awesome. And so I ended up hiring her for about a year and she would arrange rights and meetings, you know, publisher meetings and eight arm people and, and co-writes. And, and, and she had a bunch of connections. She had managed Matthew West. And she, like I said, she'd been, she'd been high up in words. So she, she knew people and was so, so great. Cindy actually died a few years ago. I just want to mention that because she's just an amazing per- person, but, but she mm-hmm. basically got me a deal. She just, you know, I started getting cuts because she was getting me in rooms with rooms with people and she was able to like see in me what I needed to be doing and who, and the kind of people that I would succeed with. And, and it was trial and error, but I mean, she she just did some great some great co- connecting. I started getting cuts. Jump ahead three or four years after that, you know, I, I signed a fair trade, and then I just was realizing, hey, I don't know if I can keep making making money at this if I live in Texas. Short version in 2015, after just like a bunch of other stuff, I had, my my dad passed away in, in somewhere around that earlier than that, and there was a long deal with me having some depression and. And kind of rethinking my whole career and in any way, but a bunch of different sort of, you know, things came together. And I was like, it doesn't make any sense to keep songwriting in the CCM world from Texas. So, Mm. which I don't, I'm not saying that's, that's true. I'm saying for me, that was true. Like, I think people can make it without being in Nashville, especially now after COVID. No, that's, that's really good. That that was a lot. I I hope that doesn't like over, you know, I didn't mean to overwhelm you. No, that's, I love it. I mean, that, that's. I mean, I feel like that's what we're doing this for is that, you know, for people to hear, you know, it wasn't something where it's like, oh, I wrote this song to clear the stage. Next thing you know, I'm a, you know, signed writer. Right. Like there's a lot that goes into that. Well, And, and the weird thing about that, Brian, is songs can be successful and, and still not cause what you think they're going to cause. Because that song really, mm. there are people who are going to hear this podcast who've never heard that song for sure. It's not like it's, yeah. uh, I can only imagine. But there are other people who I will like sit down in a room and they'll realize I played it and they'll think I'm Jesus kind of, you know what I mean? Not really, but you know what I mean? Like they'll be like, oh my gosh, yeah. you wrote clear this, you know, like I've, you know I, that guy? yeah, <laughs> because it has this weird kind of viral and it's kind of that same thing I'd mentioned earlier about the breakaway thing with the songs is that it, it's never, it's not like it ever broke out and was like a radio hit. Right. But mm-hmm. it's just kept going. Like it just keeps going. I mean, if, if you, here, here's a funny thing that I always tell people to explain the weird viral thing of clear the stage, go on YouTube right now and type in clear the stage you don't have time in your day today to get through all of the lyric videos, covers, da- the interpretive dance, whatever it is. Dude, yeah. there are hundreds, hundreds wow. of them. There's, it's crazy. Like there's so many mm. of those. And yet it's not like it's a song that's ever been on, on the radio. And that's one that you, I mean, <clears throat> you know, you've written probably thousands of songs at this point. Yeah. And just this one song that probably at the time felt amazing. Like you said, you know, you love being the creator, but it wasn't like... It was probably just a song that you did and you wrote another one the next day. Sure. You know? And but- there's no sense in, in, in your mind that, no, I, I remember thinking this feels special, but it wasn't mm-hmm. like I thought this feels like it'll be a hundred times bigger than everything else I've ever done, which it, yeah. which it totally is. Wow. So then, you know, you're, you're in the Nashville area and you're writing for CCM and it's, it, I don't know, I keep getting this theme from God's like, you're just sort of following after him and in this unique area where you're not going after that thing that everybody, you know, the prize that everyone seems to want, you know, you're just kind of like writing what you feel like needs to be said and like not resisting that, but like God keeps kind of pulling you in, in the, to the CCM world and like something that you didn't necessarily strive or even think would be a thing is like a thing. So like, like with that, like you're writing songs and then somewhat recently, 
you started like releasing songs, like things I'm afraid of. Mm -hmm. And like, how did all of that sort of restart as far as you like putting stuff out as Ross King, the artist, you know, in the streaming world? Man, it's funny because I I wish I could say it was like a really strategic thing. But for me, there's just been, I mean, if you really like, you're giving me a chance to sound really cool, but if you did like a (laughs) what's wrong with Ross and and how has he blown it? You know, like you could do a whole podcast of ways in which it's like, oh, you had that opportunity and you and you kind of didn't take advantage of it. Or, oh, you met those people or, you know, or, oh, you had that skill set and you didn't really use it. There's a lot of that in my career. And I don't say that as like a self-deprecating is just to be honest. I've really struggled with mm-hmm. like opportunities and how to like maximize them. And that's honestly, Brian, I mean, just totally honest watching what what you've done with this stuff. I've just been like, man, I just kind of want to hang out with Brian just because he seems like he totally understands how to maximize his his skill sets, you know? And I just think that's man. super, super cool. Put that feather in your cap because I mean, I'm watching and what you're doing is really impressive to me. But I'll say that for me, it's almost always been in response to need. So like mm. I came out here, oh, I'm going to be a big songwriter. Oh, okay. That didn't work. Well, I have all these fans who still kind of want to hear me write songs. Okay, well, I'll write songs. Oh, well, so my dad dies in this drowning accident in 2012. I'm super depressed. Mm. I'm start, starting to talk about about depression. People are responding to that. Oh, I didn't realize there wasn't Christian music about depression. Oh, I guess I'll write. Mm. I'll just write this stuff because I really need to get it out because I'm I'm depressed and I and I want and I'm learning stuff, you know, from the Lord and and He's walking me through this. And and so it just was like need stuff, you know. So things I'm afraid of was literally like a oh I think I've written something really right about depression, you know, because I'd written some other stuff that kind of hinted at it, but I was like you know what I think I'm actually honing in on something that's really kind of a zeitgeist moment thing. Like the whole world's talking about emotional and mental health and Christians really aren't. And I've always Mm. been kind of good at talking about stuff in the spaces. So putting plain speech on things, you know, just kind of speaking the plainest truth that I can find. So I just put out this song and it's my far and away biggest streamer ever, like not even Mm. close, 10 times as big as my second biggest thing. And I was like, okay, I guess I have this other thing where I need to keep saying these kinds of things because Christian music isn't necessarily doing it, you know? And, Mm. and that doesn't mean that no one is, I just, what I'm, what I'm aware of, no one's doing it. And so I just started saying, all right, my new thing is I'm going to speak to hard things. I'm going to... One of the things, Brian, I would say to people who are trying to learn to write great music is I would say this. If you say something a lot and have not written that, you need to go write that. If you hear something in conversation all the time, a phrase, an idea, and you have not written that or you haven't heard a song about it, go write that. If you continue to bump into some concept that gets you riled up or passionate or sad or emotionally motivated in some way and have and you've not written that, go write that. Because so mm. often what's happening is we sit down and say, which, you know, which should I write? And we think what we're supposed to say or what culture needs to hear or we go through these sort of Christian phrases. No, unless you're amazing at writing pop hooks, that's probably not going to work for you. And then it, then still, it's probably going to be kind of shallow. Uh, what I do is I say, oh my gosh, I keep talking about fear. I keep saying some version of, I keep sort of motivating my own soul by saying, Ross, whatever you're afraid of, God can scare that stuff off. Do not let that mm. stuff scare you because God can scare that stuff off. That stuff's afraid of God. That stuff's afraid of mm. him. Oh, okay. That's a song. I need to write that song, right? And- yeah. If I'm talking about depression and counseling and medication and things, and I'm realizing no one's talking about depression, medication, and counseling, and every time I talk about it over coffee, people are being impacted. Oh, I got to write that into a song, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound very songy, right? Those those (laughs) phrases, but I don't care. It doesn't matter. We're in a new world here. We're in the world where John Mark McMillan got away with sloppy wet kiss. You don't have to worry how songy it is. You just write what keeps coming up. And that's kind Mm. of been my thing now is I just, I'm making entire records, entire songs out of the stuff I keep saying, the stuff I keep hearing, the stuff I can't stop thinking about, right? And so you're even going to hear times when, oh, Ross wrote that song kind of three times. He kind of wrote the same thing three times. No. Okay. Well, that's okay because I had three songs worth of stuff. I've Mm. been saying that for a year. There's a lot going on there. I'm talking about that for an entire year or my wife keeps saying it or my kids keep saying it. It's a very basic thing, but it's something I didn't realize until recently. Oh man. This is something that I think about quite a bit because like in the space, you know, like, Hey, how come that doesn't exist? Well, what if 
there's a question I want to get to in this, but like if something doesn't exist in the space you're in, then maybe you have to be the first one to do that thing. Right. And those people are the early adopter innovator geniuses, right? Just real quick, I will say to you, yeah. things I'm afraid of was my only ever in my span of my career, my only ever early adoption moment, to be honest with you, was me going, hmm. Christians aren't doing this. I know how to do this. I'm going to do this. And it's not like it like changed the world, but for but it changed my career. Like I have 10 times as many fans as I've ever had right now because of things I'm afraid of. A lot of people obviously have the ability, they have the antenna up to recognize those things. So like, what's your encouragement to them about like working through the fear and the lack of confidence to do it? And it could just be like, I'm just going to do it, close my eyes, jump in and see what happens. But like, I think so many people are held back by imposter syndrome, by fear, by lack of confidence because they feel like, oh, well, I'm not good enough to like, put my flag up in this desert land. Mm. So like, what, what have you done or how did you get there to where like, I need to say things I'm afraid of. I need to put it out there. Right. But like, how did you actually do that? Like what gave you the strength? Right. And and I'll say a couple of things. One is that I had a very, very specific church planting experience for 17 years back in Texas, where our biggest ethic pretty much was authenticity and honesty and like true community. So I mm. was trained to speak about awkward things and not feel awkward. And so like, you know, I've been doing house shows way before house shows kind of became a thing because I just was okay sitting in an awkward room and telling my stories and singing and everybody in the room felt more awkward than I did. You know what I mean? Like that. And, and I'm just that guy who, Brian, if you and I were talking and I sensed something was needed to be asked, I would say, Brian, I don't want you to feel awkward here, but I just need to ask you, are you okay in this area? And I just want you to know, you can tell me. And I know it's going to be weird to tell me, but I want to talk to you about it because it seems like you're kind of hurting, you know, in this area, or it seems like you need something in this area. Or I'm that guy who will say a super awkward thing. And just be okay with it. And I'm not bragging. I'm saying that's just the way I'm wired. Okay. And my church planning yeah. experience did that. So one, I was, I have been trained to talk awkwardly. Okay. So that's something that we should all just get used to that. Once again, go look at mainstream television, mainstream movies, mainstream pop. They are talking way more awkwardly than we are. They are speaking mm. way more honestly than we are. I don't know why. It's just a thing. Go listen to like, the best songwriters in pop music right now are speaking way more honestly than anybody in Christian music. Is. So that's one thing. And then the second thing that I would say is that I think we can get kind of territorial about our personal ideas or our personal dreams. And so what will happen is often something won't get executed well because we were too concerned about executing it ourselves. I think collaboration is huge. Like I am just a mess, Brian, and I have looked in the mirror a hundred times and said, Lord, bring that guy in that mirror, more collaborative partners who can help him because he's just can't do it. You know, that's, I just am not that good at doing things by myself and I need people. And I've just, the, one of the great failures of my career is that I've just struggled to find creative partners. I would say this, like things I'm afraid of is an example. I did not think it was a great song and I'm not going to act like it is. I mean, it's been great for me. Okay. But and a lot of yeah. these folks have never heard this song. Go listen to the song. And what you'll hear is a product of collaboration because I wrote the whole thing by myself, but had no clue what to do with it and no clue how to make it what it needed to be. And I found two guys who had been musical partners of mine, Ben Backus and Mark Campbell. They're in that band for King Country. And they're just these super talented, joyful, God-loving, awesome guys who are fans of my music. And they, I said, I need to turn this into what it is in my mind, but I can't. And if I had tried to just push that all the way, like I'd done so many years in my career where I produced all my own music and all that, it wouldn't have done any of that. Those guys heard the emotion in it. They heard the different parts. You know, one of the things I talk about in, in the sort of songwriting, crafting part of that song is there's a section, there's a pre-chorus that happens twice in the song where I choose to kind of describe the emotional health part of it in a super specific and kind of technical way. And so one of the lines is, you know, like, when my depression is affecting every ounce of me, I can get the medication and the counseling so I can hear the yep. voice calling mm -hmm. out to me. Like, and it's kind of a rappy yep. kind of a like... I'm kind of hitting three notes, right? Yeah. And I'm saying these very technical things like medication and counseling. And and I wanted that section to feel frenetic and crazy and kind of emotionally unhealthy. You know what I mean? And so they heard yeah. that and they did that. You know, like they so all that to say, like, we have to be more humble and generous and open to like 
hear people come into it and say, hey, man, that thing is 80% awesome. But if you do it the way you're going to do it, the 20% that's not awesome is going to keep it from being great, Mm -hmm. right? And we're not the guys that could write that song, but we're the guys that can interpret that song for you. We're going to put it out there. And so they did it, you know? And so I would say finding people who understand what you do and can champion it, but are not going to lie to you about it. Gosh, I'm sure you know this because of your job as a producer, but people get shafted so often by Mm. bad hires. You know, like I'm going to hire this person to make this great. That person doesn't really understand what you're doing or, you know, collaboration with people who love you and who understand what you're doing will speak honestly and want the best for what you're doing and take pride in their part of it. That's a huge, huge, huge part of what I do. And when I have succeeded, those coming alongside tribe people are just immeasurably valuable to what I do. And Mark and Ben have been huge for that to where they almost kind of A&R me now. I was telling them about two or three different ideas I had for an album title the other day because I just want to hear their thought. I just need people to kind of rein in my crazy, but hear the, the stuff that maybe is is brilliant or really good, right? And then shave away the parts of that that are keeping it from getting as far as it can go. I just think so often we get precious about, oh, I had this idea. It's amazing. If I hand it off, someone's going to get pieces of it. One thing I say all the time, you'll get this as a songwriter, 100% of a mediocre impact is not as good as 20% or 50% or 70% of a massive impact. Does that make Man. sense? Like. I want so I want to be part of the biggest thing, not 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 biggest like rich, but like biggest like this changed people and clear the stage. When I handed that to Jimmy Needham, everybody in the country thinks he wrote that song. I don't care. It's everywhere, mm. you know, because of him. Right. I don't care if people think I wrote it. It doesn't matter to me. I mean, I probably do sometimes, but I'm saying ultimately I'm like, hey, I'm a part of that. I'm a part of that. And he had to do the same thing, dude. He had to actually call me and say, hey, man, I called you a dozen times and said, look, let's write a clear the stage song. And I just realized I'm never going to write that song, but I'm too like <laughs> prideful to like admit it. Like mm. I just want to record the song. And I'm like, Jimmy, mm. you sing better than me. You play better than me. You have more fans than me. You need to take whatever, you know, sort of like strokes you need. Take that from that. Like you're going to take it places I could never take it. And sure, I can write it and you couldn't. But, you, but every other part of this, you do 10 times better than me. That's the body of Christ. Like we need to be doing that kind of submission to each other and saying, oh, no, no, you're better at this part of this. Then that's so like humbling ourselves. I mean, that's Jesus, right? Like it's not about, yeah. But it's also, Brian, it is humbling and it also tells you what you're great at. If you and I sat down and started doing work together, within moments, we would both be saying two things that are equally beautiful. Man, Brian's good at this. Man, Ross is good at this, right? But also, but man, he really... He, he really needs me for this. Like, I'm really good at this. Mm. Wow. He values what I'm doing there. And dude, that is, I mean, there's no better combination of feelings just sort of in the kingdom, right? Than humbled by what you're not great at, but affirmed in your callings and skills, right? That That's a perfect cocktail of existence in the kingdom of Jesus. Man, that's a mic drop bummer right there. That's Boom. so good. Um, so, you know, like I said, I've heard your name come up with so many artists, you know, Joel Vaughn comes to mind right now, just being a champion for people. So, you know, along your journey, I always, and you've, there's been so many amazing nuggets already, but you know, any type of like advice that you possibly give to younger Ross, maybe it's on the breakout stage, whatever that is. Cause I, I feel like these are such valuable moments for people. And we usually use these as like our share and teaser clips for these episodes, but just any type of advice you tell younger Ross to kind of help you along your journey and also our listen, whoever's listening right now. Yeah, sure. So younger Ross, there's probably a couple of things. One is I would say, um, listen to your critics and invite your critics with more intentionality. There's so many things that I now know about my songwriting sort of inadequacies that took me way too long to learn because I was so committed to believing my own hype, right? And some of that's just, you know, big fish in a small pond stuff, you know? So listen to your critics, you know, and I don't mean that as like a, you know, get depressed about it and think they're always right. But I just mean, if something's being said a bunch of times, even if it's wrong, you need to ask yourself why it's being said, right? So Mm. I would say that, you know, and then I would also say, learn to love the stuff that you're not good at and then either work to be better at it or maybe even smarter than that, find people who would love to work with you 
who are good at that. I would guess, Brian, with as productive and as good at this as you are, you've probably heard these like work smarter, not harder type things and don't spend too much time making your weaknesses your strengths because you're not going to or whatever, you know, and I think there's some truth to that. But I think there's a kind of a combo of like this long game of, no, no, over time, I'm going to get better at what I stink at. And in the meantime, Mm -hmm. one way I'm going to do that is I'm going to surround myself by people who are better at the things that I stink at, right? And I'm going to see what they do and I'm going to like learn it. So I just think for me, I was too like, I'm a lyric guy and that'll get me everywhere. So I released Mm -hmm. dozens of songs that had really strong lyrics and okay on the music side. Right. And Mm. I wish I had worked harder. I wish I'd invited people in and said, hey, here's just a lyric. I'm not going to try to tell you what the melody is. You're a great melody writer. What would you do with this? You know, or I wish I would have studied melody the way that I do now. You know, one sort of anecdotal version of that is when I heard Good, Good Father or No Longer Slaves to Fear, I'm a Child of God type songs 20 years ago, I in my heart would have said, well, that's really simple and kind of like rolled my eyes at it. Now Mm -hmm. I'm blown away that someone can go, whoa, they just said like 10 words and it's really, really compelling. And it's not Mm -hmm. even fresh. It's not even like that's a fresh idea that I'm hearing there. Why? And some of that's intangible, right? Some of that's just the spirit landing on something. But also there's some mechanics of just like strong melody. Because I wasn't good at it, I I wrote it off, right? And now I'm like, whoa, whoa, I hear something that's like compelling that I couldn't do. I am like going to school. You know, I'm getting my notes out and and I'm also just appreciating it. Right. So, you know, learning to not just appreciate what you're bad at, but then looking for ways that you can humbly learn to be better at it. I think that's so important. And I, and I know like for me personally, like, you know, I want to get better at playing piano because it would speed up my workflow, you know, but like, instead of just throwing my hands up, be like, you know, or the classic ones, like, you know, I, I'm about terrible with names. I never remember names, but like, if you say it, then you'll never get any better. And yeah, you may never be the best person at that thing, but just like, like you said, like going to school, going to YouTube, you know, yes. going to courses, going to just talking to people. And like, even if you're not the best, you're way better than you were. You just have to apply yourself. Right. And being round, well-rounded, like, yeah, we're doing like a lot of things, you know, between podcasts and songwriting and production, all these things. But like, we're not the best at necessarily any of those things, but like, we're trying to at least push ourselves to a level to work because there is that thing where like, yeah, you may not be the best, you know, lyric writer or melody writer or whatever, but like you might push yourself to a level to where you start getting eyes on what you're doing from those people that are actually really good at it. And that'll up your level when you get to spend time with those people. So yeah, never give up. I, I, there's this funny story. Like my, one of my friends once I was like, yeah, you know, I should have learned it when I could. And I'm like, you're still alive. Yeah. Like you could still learn now. Like Yeah, when I could. There, there, is, there is no when I could. Yeah, when I could is now. One of the things I tell my songwriting students is there's a concept in woodworking called jigs. And it's this idea where you make something that helps you make other things, right? Because you realize, well, there, there's no tool that is going to help that I can go to Lowe's and buy that helps me make a straight cut of a long board. Or there is a tool, but it's $150. So you go on the internet and you're like, you look up jig for long straight cuts and someone has, you know, a bunch of people have these things where they tell you, okay, well today, Ross, instead of making a long straight cut, you're going to make a thing that makes a long straight cut, right? Mm. Well, that stings because that's a whole day lost and I won't have anything when I'm done except this thing that makes other things. Well, that's weird. Why would I want to do that? But that's what it takes, right? So in your situation, it's like, all right, Brian, this week you have three clients who want you to do demos for this much money. And you're going to play piano like a laborious child with nine fingers and be terrible at it, right? All right, you know mm-hmm. what I'm going to do, Ross, instead? I'm going to go on YouTube and I'm going to play piano for two hours a day this week. And I'm not going to get those demos done. But – My muscle memory is going to kick in on that fourth or fifth day because I have skill and I'm decent at it. And next week I'm going to do those demos faster because I worked on my piano and I lost all those hours of immediate money making. Right. But I, Mm -hmm. and I do this all the time, Brian, like I will spend a, you know, an hour listening to Spotify pop songs that I don't care for to learn what melodies are going on. Or I will Mm -hmm. realize there's a picking pattern on the guitar that I stink at and I'll just sit at my guitar while I'm doing something else, reading emails or whatever, and I'll just pick, 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 and I'll lose a day. And I'm making a jig sort of, right? I mean, like, and I still am not the best at this, but this is something I seek to do because I hate the idea that there's a threshold that every time I bump into it, it's way too high for me. And I'm hitting it all the time, right? I'm hitting it like 
twice a week. And it's like, oh, I keep hitting this threshold, right? Yeah. And it's like, dude, stop hitting that threshold. Either quit doing that thing, hire a piano yeah. guy. You kind of got two, you got two choices, right? I'm gonna start hiring a keys guy, you know, and and just giving him some of the demo cost, or I'm gonna learn to play piano better. But I can't just keep making demos and, and, yeah. and hitting this problem. Does that make sense? Totally. It's like I keep thinking about teach a man to fish, you know. Yes. He catches the fit and he can catch his own fish, but if you just give him fish, he's hung, he's good for the day. So right. it's like sometimes you just gotta put the work in, sacrifice the little bit of time, but then in the long run, I mean, you save countless hours plus too, it becomes more enjoyable because it's more fun when you're not working through the mechanics of things. You're just actually getting to create and like, that's the inspiration part. So right. man, I love that you said that. So I love for you to tell people like how they can connect with you and, you know, any music and stuff. I know that you started dropping singles and stuff. And also I've seen your, uh, your, your side stuff with your sync music too. So, you know, yeah. feel free to talk about any of that stuff, anything you got going on, man. What's, and then where people can find you. Yeah, I'll go brief. I, on the sync side you're talking about, none of that's really worth promoting except just to say that I do a lot of writing for film TV ads just because I enjoy it. And this is kind of back to our discussion about just pop hooks. I, I've just, I decided that I wanted to really work on, just writing songs that were compelling because the melody was nice or the chorus had a nice ring to it, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's where kind of sync happened. And I've got a couple of side bands. I have a band called The Complete Fiction with a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And we do some stuff that I love. You can go look it up on Instagram or Facebook or on Spotify or Apple. But for my own stuff, I am really, try I've been trying for years to quit doing it and it just, I just can't stop doing it. I'm just writing, you know, songs under my name, Ross King, and I'm releasing them. And, and the primary sort of thing there is that I'm probably never going to compete with mainstream CCM, but I'm also never really going to compete with like the most indie of indies, which is the kind of cool indie, you know, like the, I don't know how to even say this without sounding like I'm picking on somebody, but there, there's kind of an indie sound almost, you know what I mean? Sure. And I, yeah, I, just, yeah. I don't really have that because I love pop music. So what I do is I, I'm trying to, my current, the current Ross King plan is, is to write the <laughs> poppiest songs I can melodically and hook wise that say things that matter and that are in the spaces and that, that minister to, to places that maybe aren't being ministered to as much in CCM, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, I'm talking about depression and anxiety. I'm talking about kind of politics in the middle you know, like, you know, trying mm -hmm. to, to, to to kind of redeem this idea of like, we're not a people who are here to vote for the best president or whatever. We're, we're people who are to worship a king and to find his kingdom in every single place, whether we like it or not, whether it's comfortable or not. So I talk about race stuff and I, because I have adopted children who are non-white. And so I have a bunch of just, I'm trying to speak into some spaces that are sometimes awkward, that are probably going to challenge you some I'm probably going to disagree with you about some things, but I'm constantly seeking to to like find the scripture, the word, the truth, and then sing a pop melody. So wrap that up in, a, in like a pop melody. So so I'm unapologetically saying I think that what I'm doing is unique. It's not the best in the world, but I really believe in it. And I promise you that if you come to my music and engage it, you will not hear the same old thing. I can also promise you that I'm wrong a lot and that I'm just trying to make my way as a wounded, hardworking, struggling man in his middle age. But yeah, so go look for me. Ross King Music is probably the easiest way to type in almost almost anywhere, Instagram, Facebook, and you can find me on Spotify and Apple under Ross King. And if you want a primer, just go to the top stuff because it'll be things I'm afraid of and clear the stage. And that'll get you my probably my best career stuff. And then you know, hopefully that hooks you and you can go do a deep dive. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure to link all that stuff in the Thank descriptions because definitely want people to check that out and follow along with the journey because, you know, and uh, just – just thank you for being bold and yeah. not that's something that a lot of people can gain a lot of benefit from because it's not easy necessarily to to do those awkward things and to be mm -hmm. out there and put yourself in the line because you can take you know flack for that sometimes people are like well this isn't the normal cookie cutter thing yeah. so like what is it they don't know what to make of it but if you're just challenging a listener and man as a as an artist and a creator as a writer like what better thing can you be doing so right. thank you so much for doing of that of course of course man thank you for ha having me and and thanks for letting me have a platform for that last thing i want to do uh is i'd like to pray over you before uh before we go so thank you, god man. thank you so much for ross thank you so much for uh, his heart thank you so much for his acute awareness of the spaces that, you know, being called to write about those things and call attention to those things that maybe kind of hide in the dark that people are afraid. But at, at the same time, like those are the probably the areas that we need to bring light to the most, God. And since you're the light, you bring uh, 
you d- darkness cannot be where you are. So God, thank you for continuing to challenge Ross to, to find those, those topics and those conversations that need to be brought out to bring comfort and peace to people's hearts, to know that no matter what you're going through, you're never alone, God. And, um, just bring your sovereign hand and your your heart and your love into every person who here this, uh, listens to this interview today and listens to Ross's music and, and all the things that he's doing. God, we just thank you for him and his family and uh, excited for this new season of, of all that you're doing. God, I just c- pray continued inspiration, wisdom, guidance, and direction in all that he does. God, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. We want to help reach as many Christian indie artists and songwriters as possible. And one way we can do that is with your help. So if you could take a minute and leave us a review on iTunes, that would be so appreciated. This is how the iTunes algorithm will push this content out to more and more Christian indie artists and songwriters. So like I said, if you could just take a couple seconds, leave us a review, that would be so awesome. It means so much to us and we would really appreciate it.